the Prime Minister's been in Australia for the weekend, securing a pathway to citizenship for Kiwis living and working there. But has he also just made it much harder to keep our best and brightest here in New Zealand, filling the jobs that we so desperately need filled? In particular, health workers. Green MP Chloe Swarbrick and Axe David Seymour are with us this morning. We thought, because we're getting so much feedback from people saying, I'm leaving, my son's leaving, my daughter. We'd bring in some really positive politicians <laughs> to sell New Zealand back to us, all right? So let me give you some examples, um, David. Lockie is 21 years old. He said Australia's always been on the radar because of higher wages, but this has sold it to him, this decision at the weekend, and he is now going to get on a plane. Um, Maria says she's been looking at jobs. She can get $35,000 more a year there. And this has also made her re, uh, begin her search again for a job across the Tasman. So what do we say to these um, bright, talented, hard-working people? Well, first of all, you start with the truth. I mean, wages are higher over there. Um, you know, some people say the weather's better. I, I'm not so sure. I think it's just hot all the time. Um, ultimately, we have a better future in New Zealand if we get our policies right. It is possible to make it easier and therefore more affordable to build a home. It's possible to cut back on the red tape and regulation that stops people wanting to come and invest and create more interesting jobs here. All of that is possible, but it will actually take a change of direction. So there's no point saying to someone like Lockie uh, that you know things are, uh, are the same either way. I mean, the fact is that we've got a $24,000 income gap for the median wage. The median person over there gets paid 24 grand more than the median person here. Um, what it's going to require is a concerted effort to focus on economic growth. I would argue that New Zealand for the last five, actually for the last 15 years, has been tied up with far too much discussion about socially engineering us into a new version of the treaty that isn't supported by the actual document. Far too too much social engineering around red tape and regulation, not enough getting stuff built and making life affordable and making life a joy. Okay, and you include the key years in that, um, obviously. Yeah, it's I do. Thing. Okay. Um, let's just have, give you an example, because you mentioned the um, median. This is the average pay, the difference between the mm. two. Take a look at this. Mm. Obviously, the kangaroo gets you 102500 New Zealand dollars. Mm. In New Zealand, $77,844. Mm. Mm. Chloe, in the meantime, while we wait for the this amazing economic transformation to happen <laughs> that, that David is talking Two about. Two quite different yeah. versions. Yes. Yeah. But, but, that, but that's but, the truth. I mean, no, I get it. it. No, I get the, it. But the, just, the, I just want to yeah. make a point with Chloe. Yeah. In the meantime, if you are 21 mm. and you are wanting to get yourself and your family ahead, you would leave, wouldn't you? Look, I, I think that actually you'll find general common ground here, although very different means to achieve it, in that we do have the potential here in Aotearoa and New Zealand to really take control of all of those variables and ensure that everybody has what they need to live their best possible life. What's really interesting reflecting on the history of this country is in the, in the 1930s and 40s, subsequent to the World Wars, we decided that we would be the economic petri dish of the world, create the social welfare state, uh, and pay for that by virtue of taxing the wealthy. In the 1980s, we had massive deregulation and some of the uh, kind of consequences of that we're still feeling to this day in terms of the underinvestment in our public infrastructure, not the least our housing, our health and our education systems. Mm -hmm. So in 2023, we are confronted with a problem, a fork in the road. Do we want to take that same kind of approach that we took in the 30s where we made that requisite investment when, when and government we paid expenditure for it, was lower than it or is now. do we want to continue <laughs> down the pathway of that massive underinvestment? And I guess just to kind of draw some parallels with Australia. Australia have a capital gains tax. Australia have higher tax rates and they pay for that necessary public infrastructure. They also have the equivalent of what we recently passed in the form of fair pay agreements, higher unionisation, and therefore a workforce that is enabled to fight for those rights, those okay. pay and that condition. So here, this is where, about where I thought we would land. Mm. We would well, have well, you guys let's, saying let's that we, we, we need to have stronger unions, we need to have stronger yeah. demands in terms of pay and stuff. But how do you actually pay for well, that Ryan, without first an economy all, let's, to let's support it? Let's just get it. some facts. I mean, unionisation in New Zealand is 18%. In Australia, it's 13%. So, you know, let's deal with facts. Government spending in the 30s and 40s as a percentage of GDP was lower than it is now. So this whole idea that if we just somehow unionise and tax people more, everything will be fixed. You know, Australia can do some of that stuff because they are wealthier. 
a lot of countries have worse policies than New Zealand, but you don't get wealthy Absolutely. Uh, by taxing, by unionising, by regulating and tying people okay. up with red tape. All right, let's, let's, let's accept that for a second, <laughs> if we can, because I, I want to get to the crux of why it is that they earn so much more than us in Australia, mm. why it is that their economy is so much bigger than ours. Obviously, we're a smaller country, we're a little more um, removed from the rest of the w world. But... For you, Chloe, what is the number one reason you think that Australians earn more than us? Mining. <laughs> well, well, you, could, you could talk about extractive. You could talk about an extractive-based well, economy. Well, it's actually but... productivity. Mm. They just do more with less. Mm. For every one hour mm. that we work they make about a third more mm -hmm. than what we do. And I don't have the most up-to-date figures off the top of my head, but we also have extensive research from the Productivity Commission and a range of NGOs in this country that show us that actually New Zealanders also tend to work a lot longer than many of the other jurisdictions that we compare ourselves to. So we're working longer, but also with far less kind of productivity that is money that we're making so out of that work. So how do we, if we know, because mm -hmm. we have been told that this is the reason, mm -hmm. How do we address that problem, mm. David? What do we do to increase our productivity and what policy mm. are you going to put in place if you are, end up in government around a cabinet table mm. come October? Well, one of the most important things that we can do is education at the moment. You know, we don't know how many kids go to school. Uh, we don't have a clearly defined national curriculum of what they should learn. Uh, we need to have an education system that says these are the community agreed goals that kids must learn, a government that's committed to measuring those things, and then treats the profession with some respect and actually lets them run schools their way to achieve the goals. Uh, that's the most important long-term thing. In the short term, I would look at the number of important projects. For example, Ports of Tauranga are trying to expand as a classic example, where people are tied up for years. It often takes longer to get permission to do something in New Zealand than actually do it. So this red tape and regulation story is important. But I'd also say something about leadership. You look at what's happened this weekend. Anzac Day, we're all mates, etc. Actually, we just got played by the Aussies. The Aussie government played Hipkins like a didgeridoo. You know, they have just done a raid on New Zealand talent, including many of your viewers, apparently. Yeah. And Hipkins is over there smiling, saying how wonderful it all is. And in fact, he's trying to say that it's one of the Labour government's most substantial achievements, which is helping New Zealanders live in another country. Um, and what's more, it wasn't even his decision, it was the Australian government's yeah, decision. So a, I we, agree, we, 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 need, we, we should have a Prime Minister saying, look, we understand the Australians are doing this, but here's how we're going to boost productivity with some policies in New Zealand. He's not doing that, he's over there getting paid right. like a didgeridoo. Chloe, what... <laughs> Chloe, what um, Let's hope he comes back like a boomerang, though, right? Um, <laughs> no, let's not. He'll stay over there. We're we'll better off. <laughs> Chloe, what, what, what's the Green Party putting forward mm. at the 2023 election to help solve the issue of productivity, the one we know is leading to this brain drain? No, I can't, unfortunately, announce on the AM show this morning all of our policies fully costed for we the 2023 for election. But what I can say is that I think it is really worthy that we inspect the fundamental question here, which is what is the economy and who is it for? So the economy is all of us, and it's the stuff that we create. It's not this deity that we're supposed to sacrifice to when it's angry. And if you look at the economic policy that's kind of been deployed throughout COVID-19, you know, we've had this kind of pretense that the things that the RBNZ does, our central bank, are happening in a vacuum and not at all impacted by fiscal policy, the tax and spend, the stuff that the government does. That is untrue. And the unconventional monetary policy that was deployed in that vacuum uh, saw that trillion dollar wealth transfer to the wealthiest. And now, now that we're in this process of recovery and re build and high inflation, we're seeing a situation where RBNZ uh, confirmed in response to my questioning at Finance and Expenditure Committee that they are manufacturing a recession yeah. and effectively expecting I, I think in, in fairness they put New that Zealanders, out as a press release but. for New Zealanders <laughs> to pay for that recovery when they also are the ones who effectively paid for us getting through the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. and that is fundamentally unfair. I must say that's a very unproductive answer given the question which was about yeah. productivity. Well, here, well, here's, you have here's to another, that everybody here's, has here's to the basics, I mean, here, I mean, here's so another one. If I Brian, may. You know. Well, you had a chance. So, I mean, we got a fully costed alternative budget that would allow the average person, someone, a nurse mid scale, earning about 70 grand, to keep more than $50 a week of their own money, more money in their pocket to fight the price rises that everyone is facing. Right. You know, we are a highly Can, taxed that's country. Not, that's not, not an answer to the working. question of productivity. No, the the no, major, the well, major it, it actually, issue with regard well, to Well, I can make it one if you're going to talk about the stress 
stresses that people are under, what we do know is that poverty is a massive detriment to people's ability to apply themselves to their job and to, and to continue to be productive. We have massive issues with regard to that stress, that poverty stress in terms of our housing costs in this country, but also in terms of those low wages. So it is continuing to advocate for greater unionisation so that workers have the ability to continue to advocate for themselves right. and raise those pains and conditions, but also... But we're already more unionised than Australia. Uh, reducing yeah. those costs of housing. OK, all right. Very quickly, because uh, we're, we're wrapping now, but um, tax, there's a report out on Wednesday. This is basically just one-word answers at this point. But, um, <laughs> you know, do you think that we're going to see the government go somewhere with taxes this week or no? By the budget, by the election, because they believe someone somewhere has got some money and if we took okay. that, all our problems would be solved. That's not how you create the conditions. Yeah, I know, but I don't think they're going to go there with tax. Do you think they actually will, Chloe? I would love to see some political backbone <laughs> because but you're not governments <laughs> have commissioned these it. reports. Look, I mean, we had in 2020 some indicative research from the IRD that showed that millionaires in this country are paying lower effective tax rates than those but, of ours. But you're not holding your breath. I am not holding well, my breath. Right. Based on the track record of the past You ought to read the, the latest report out of Oliver Shaw last week. I saw that. Which took question on. And, and it, it, it showed that you're wrong. It showed that people pay a higher percentage of their tax and income as they earn yeah, but And it, it was thoroughly right ridiculed. No, no it, included, it included capital tax. It was all economic income. All right. And people like Chloe need to look at that and okay, stop very trying quickly. to beat up and, and say, if we very tax quickly. more people, we'll get more very, money. Very quickly, Elizabeth Kitty Kitty, this whole situation, mm. Chloe, um, do you think that there are people in your caucus and in your party who think she's a bully? And, and do, you, do you think that the party needs to do something about her? So you, you'll know that there's an investigation presently underway and that is being undertaken by our Chief of Staff and by our muster, Jan Logie, so it's not my place to prejudice that. Is there anything you would like to say to victims? I'd like to say that, Ryan, I'm sorry I'm not going to give you a headline and we're not going to get a soundbite out of this. It's going to be a very boring answer, which is that this investigation is presently underway. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm just focused on my work. You know, the planet is burning. We've got, based on Oxfam's report, the 136th uh, tax system for right. inequality's sake. So there's stuff to do here. Let's focus on that. <laughs> All right. And yeah. what's worse, Chloe's getting her tax advice from Oxfam. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming in this morning for a Monday morning. That's Green MP Chloe Swarbrick and ex David Seymour here on the couch.